Hey everyone, it's Andrew Claven with this week's interview, which is with Mary Harrington. I always tell you on the Andrew Claven show that I give you tomorrow's news today, and I was, I think, maybe the first person to notice this movement among highly intelligent women uh, to suddenly look askance at feminism. I noticed uh, Erica Bacchiocci and Angela Franks and Louise Perry, but prime, uh, first among equals perhaps, is Mary Harrington, a brilliant lady who is a contributing editor at Unheard. She's a self-described reactionary feminist, and I'll talk to her about that, and that's the name of her substack as well, Reactionary Feminist, and the author of the book Feminism Against Progress, which I highly recommend, and is coming out this month in paperback from Regnery. Mary, it is great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on. I, uh, I just got, you know, I, I just the other day got into a debate with my son, Spencer, where I was, he had written a, a piece for fairer disputations where you sometimes appear about chivalry. And I described it, I described fairer disputations as women who are smart enough to realize that feminism has gone bad, but refused to get rid of the name uh, feminist. And he rebuked me. He said that I was, uh, I was allowing the left to co-opt the term feminism and that um, since I care about the rights of women, I myself am a feminist. So I was forced, I stabbed him. Uh, I don't, that may have been an overreaction, but I, <laughs> I just couldn't stand that. But it, who's right there? I mean, I feel that feminism has been a failure and maybe we should just say that, but is he, does he have a point? I'm, I'm going to be ecumenical on this. I'm going to say you're both right. <laughs> All um, right. <laughs> Spencer's right in the sense that there are there are there is more than one feminism, and I don't think it's I don't think it, it's self evident that we have to hand feminism to the left. Um, but I think you're right in the sense that, particularly in the United States, and I do think this is very especially pronounced in the United States for reasons that I can bore you with for hours if you let me. Um, but it's it's especially pronounced in the United States that a certain a certain subset of feminism has become so dominant that it, that everybody on the right think that thinks that's just the the entirety of the movement, and they don't they don't get the history because it's been memory hold by by people who don't like us. Um, and so, and and so, what what America in particular understands by feminism is a is a very limited, a very narrow, and a very and a, and a very uh, aggressively liberal, aggressively disembodied, um, and aggressively, I I would argue, uh, elite um, bourgeois version understanding of the movement, which is which is hostile to a great many conservative aims and and actively sets out to attack a great many conservative. Uh, Keystone positions. So, I mean, from from an American perspective, I'd say you're right. But from a from a more, a more historical, more nuanced, more um, international perspective, I would say Spencer has a point as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> weak, weak, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> You've got to choose. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, you know, one Wait, of the I can things... I can elaborate. <laughs> Historically, you know, the women's the women's movement is internally very fractious. You know, we've always we've always argued amongst ourselves about what it means. My 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 framing for why that is is that it's. I, I think we need to throw the progress story out of the window. I think we the 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 progressivist narrative uh, that says we're going from the bad past to the good future, and that mm. this can continue indefinitely, and this always means more freedom, and it always means more stuff, and it always means more leftism. I think that's that's BS, if you forgive me. Um, it's it's simply simply false, and is obviously um, we're obviously reaching a point now with a lot of these liberatory movements where we're we're really scraping the barrel, we're reaching diminishing returns, and I would say that for all but a very elite subset of women, the liberal feminist narrative is very obviously at that point now. It's mm. actively degrading life for all but the wealthiest women. And again, from an from an American perspective, I would if 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 I, if I thought that was all of feminism, as I think you'd be forgiven for thinking if you were an American conservative, you know, I I would I would absolutely want to chuck it out of the window and say a plague on all of your houses, be gone, you know, let's start again with a fresh slate. Um, when I, when I start when I start reactionary feminist in my Twitter bio, it was kind of as a joke. It was the end of a long running Twitter argument. Uh, Twitter did all, all all through Twitter direct message with a friend about whether or not post liberal meant anything. Um, we argued about this for months, um, 
And eventually, I, he, he, he said, no, no, you should use reaction. You know, I said, no, no, post-liberal is useful, and, and I'm not going to bore you with the details. But in the end, I conceded the point. I was like, okay, yeah, no, I, I buy a reactionary. It's more punk. Okay, fine. Yeah, no, for, like, <laughs> let, let's get rid of post-liberal. Let's have reactionary instead. It's, it's, it's fightier. Um, so, I, so I changed my Twitter bio just to see how long it would take him to notice. It took about three days, I think. But in the meantime, a bunch of other people noticed, including Matt Schmitz, who was then at First Things, who said, would you like to write something for First Things about what you mean? This is an interesting term and then I had to figure out what I meant and now I've now it's a book so that's so that's kind of the origin story it literally started as a meme which then became a thing <laughs> and I like it because it's a signal scrambler it says well what you know it, it asks it but it poses the question which really you started with which is to say you know is do you do you have to believe in progress if you want to be a feminist can you care about the interests of women without signing up to the whole of the rest of that baggage train and mm. it's a long baggage train now i mean yeah. as as you spend every week discussing as as the daily wire is very fond of going into in some depth it's a long baggage train and there's a lot of stuff there that you might or might not be signed up to there's a <laughs> there's a great deal of it that i'm not signed up to but i still think that men and women are fundamentally different in some ways which you can't just you know in, innovate away and that you can't just pretend are not true and that we are irreducibly you know we're we're, we're equal we, we're equal in dignity and our capacity for excellence yada 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 however there are some irreducible differences particularly where it comes to sex reproductive roles and those things have political consequences you know at scale they they matter politically and they still matter even though we lead pretty comfortable materially Sim materially uh, frictionless lives, you know, as as denizens of the high tech developed first world, um, there are still some material differences. Where, I mean, particularly when when you have kids, the rubber hits the road, and you know, men can't breastfeed, men can't gestate, um, and there's there's and there's a whole bunch of subtler differences as well. Those things still matter. Um, you know, if we're not going to call giving a stuff about that. And wanting to talk about it, and at a, at a gen and wanting to wanting to have a politics which engages with that. If we're not going to call it feminism, what are we going to call it? Because it's a mm. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, well, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I say, why shouldn't we? Well, let, 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 let's just take the word back. You know, <laughs> why should well, they have what, it? I want that, it. mine now. That was Spencer's argument: take the word back. And right. I, you know, I, yeah. I guess I guess what I was saying is that you in in the book uh, "Feminism Against Progress." You have a chapter that was almost word for word, a chapter in my book, The Truth and Beauty, except you approached that you came there through sociology and I came there through reading poetry, which was this idea that the, the uh, industrial revolution had gutted the cottage industries and essentially stripped women of the huge uh, financial contribution, economic contribution that they were making to society as homemakers and as, as workers in the home. And, and I guess what I feel is that maybe... The, the, that was the problem and the answer was wrong and we have to go back to that first problem in order to find the real answer. Maybe I thought starting again might be a good idea, but you probably can never go back. So uh, that, that makes uh, you sense. You can't step in the same river twice. You know, I, there, yeah. there are times there are times when I wish I, I think, well, you know, maybe it would be nice. But I'm, I mean, there were, you know, I don't believe in progress and I don't believe in regress either. You know, things things change. And we we can you can notice that without ascribing a moral value to it. Um, I, I dare say there were plenty of things about living a subsist an agrarian subsistence life which sucked. You know, some yeah. things are definitely better now than they were before. Um, some okay. things are arguably worse. Um, you know, as a as as an anti progressive, as somebody as a progress atheist, I, I think I should say I don't I'm not signed up to progress theology, which says you know the the arc of the arc of the universe is long but it bends towards I don't know whatever more more <laughs> more blue hair. Whatever it is, I, I, I don't buy that. Uh, but but it, that, it doesn't follow from that that the past was necessarily better. It was just different. So right. we have to deal with where we are now. Um, and I think there are definitely lessons from the past. This is something that Spencer is is fantastic on about drawing out the lessons from the past, drawing the bringing with us the wisdom of the ages, and trying to trying to apply it afresh to where we are now. Um, so no, not simply saying, oh, you know, we have to go back to the 1950s um, or, you know, insert decade of your of your choice and then ignoring whatever it was about that decade which sucked. Um, but to say, you know, we're, we're here now. Um, and I th and and I think, we, you know, we have we have some some challenges to face now, which which we've never faced before. And, you know, perhaps perhaps the wisdom of the ages has something to teach us there. And perhaps if we just put down the progress theology goggles, we might have more materials at our, at our disposal for thinking about how we how we live together now. 
Uh, Because it's, you know, at the end of the day, men and women are going to have to go on living together, right? (laughs) Otherwise, we're not going to make more humans. And then, you know, it's it's over for all of us. So (laughs) we we have to figure something out. And it's my, you know, I have I have great faith in human nature. And I have great faith in in all of us in aggregate in the aggregate. Um, I think you know one way or another we're going to figure we're going to figure something out. Um, but I, I I guess you know I, I have a daughter. I'd prefer whatever it is that we come up with not to throw all of the babies out with the bathwater. You know there were some things which were good which came out of the you know treating you know women women are considered people. You know I think that's I that, I think that's a good thing. That's an unalloyed good. You know as a speak as a woman I, that's in my interests and I and it's in my daughter's interests as well. I do not want to find myself in a world where somehow as a sort of backswing on a kind of over- overreach, you know, a tech-enabled overreach, which pretends that none of us have, have to rely on each other to live together. Um, yep. That somehow we end up in a place where my daughter you know, loses the privilege of being considered a person. You know, that matters a lot to me, which is, I guess, is, you know, for all for all that, you know, I cling very devotedly to reactionary because I'm pretty reactionary <laughs> these days in my sensibility. I also cling to progress. And I guess that will be my positive case for it as well. You know, not just why shouldn't we have the word, but also actually it, it really matters. And each any of us, any of us that has daughters should should take seriously the positives which have come out of women's emancipation and not just think of the negatives and you know we can we could be here all day listing the the potential downsides the atomization of society and the dissolution of the family and the the scores of children that grow up fatherless and yada 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 yada, yada. but there are you know I, I would also like my daughter not to lose the privilege of being considered a person so can we, it, what, can, surely there's something there we can work with right? Yeah well you know it always startles me about all of this is that most of us, I would say a vast majority of us, kind of enjoy the fact that there are men and women and that we get together and live together and create new life. We kind of think that's that's a lot of fun and actually meaningful. And that's why I was really interested in your article in the April edition of First Things, uh, Normophobia, which I thought was a terrific piece. I'm just going to let you describe what normophobia is exactly. So I I was invited by Rusty Reno to to write a paper. We had a we had a colloquium to talk about, and he wanted me to write a paper about the family. Um, and I thought, okay, well, you know, I could write I could write something about policy. You know, we've all we, we we know what those policy papers look like. You know, can we adjust the tax system to 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 make it easier for people to have more kids? You know, could surely there's something we could do to make it easier for to have us have an, a stay at home parent? You know, there, there's all of those policy arguments, and I was thinking, no, actually, there's something more fundamental is amiss. Um, and I was I was thinking at the time a great deal about. And, and it, there's, a, there's a fundamental disposition that we have towards thinking about the family, you know, sort of basic paradigm in which most people live, which makes it almost impossible to think about the family except on the back foot. And that's that's if, if a sort of dispositional resistance to the idea that the, the, the human normal exists at all. Um, and, and so, so I decided, why don't we? Why, why don't I see if I can come at it from the other direction? Instead of trying to make the case for family, you know, against this not this frame, which I'm just going to accept. Uh, why, why don't I say I reject this frame and I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to say let, let's let's name it you know uncharitably um, in our own rhetorical interests you know not as a not as a legitimate thing but as a as a kind of bigotry you know a bigotry against the normal and the observed and the everyday and the gestalt and the inductive and the uh, the stuff that everybody any, anybody with eyes and a functioning brain can see you know we all know that there's a whole load of that stuff you know cats behave a certain way dogs behave a certain way different types of dogs have different traits and temperaments you know these things are known where it comes to dogs we find it very difficult to talk about where it comes to people this is just there's something within us which which re- recoils from the idea of of talking about human nature which is really what what I'm and when I and so when I talk about normophobia, um, it's the if if you like a worldview which is predicated on bigotry against the idea that it, that human normal exists, and from 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 a normophobic perspective, which is really the entire world that we inhabit, it becomes almost impossible to talk about the family. I mean, it, it's very difficult to talk about men and women, you know, even to say that we exist as physiologically distinct, uh, you know, sexed, you know, di- uh, uh, sexed dimorphic pe- uh, beings. Um, and even more difficult when you start to talk about normative differences between men and women. But it becomes incredibly difficult to talk about the family, uh, which is a problem 
for anybody who wants to, particularly for conservatives who want to think about the family and to make the case for, for example, some some types of family structure being better than others, which is demonstrably true. And there are, I, I can point you in the direction of any number of sociological studies, which will show that some kind some. I mean, there are even there are even liberals who publish who who who've, who've pub, you know, the two parent privilege I think it's called came out yes. recently. <laughs> but you know, a very nice, res, very respectable liberal in good standing, you know, who's who's done the you know she's read the papers and she's done she's crunched the numbers and she's very sorry to report New York Times, but it's true. Two parent families are better off; their children are better, more more well adjusted. You know, and, and none of this pointing, uh, none of this is to say that single single parent families don't often do a fantastic job under difficult circumstances. You know, the point, noticing that some some kinds of family structure are better than others is 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 in no way to detract from the great many people who whose lives are not don't quite follow that pattern and who nonetheless do a great job however we need to be able to talk about the fact that there are that some that humans have a nature and particularly well, that children have needs because it's one thing to deny that men and women have a nature or, or that humans in general have a nature but the the, the moment we start to point uh, the the normophobic mindset the the bigotry against human normal um, towards the family, um, in the name of and, and invariably the, the, the bigotry against human normal is pointed at any, any any well any human normal, if you like, will will constrain what it is that, that we're free to do. So if you say, oh, you know, women aren't normally interested in going and doing science, I might say, well, I, I want to be free to go and do a do a science career if I want to. Um, so so therefore, I reject the idea that this, that it's it's normatively true that women are more interested in something else. Um, and, and perhaps it is, you know. And there are plenty of great women scientists. Um, uh, every um, but but every every war we wage in the name of personal freedom on on a norm, however how, however flexible that norm might be, uh, ends up having a cost. Um, and the fur the further the the more we liberate ourselves through the medium of technology from the from the constraints of our of our nature, um, the more we rely on those who can't escape the, the constraints of their nature. And ultimately, my argument in normophobia, and really the focus of that of that whole of, of that whole article, was was to say that when when we point when, when we deny that such a thing as normal exists, particularly in the context of the family, the people who end up paying the price are children. Mm. Um, so, for example, in the context of surrogacy, um, we might say. Oh, you know, it's we can't speak about um, the fact that you you need you need a parent of, of both of each sex in order to make a child. We can't talk about that anymore. In that, we're, we're going to say it's fine for same sex couples to adopt. It's fine for um, same sex couples to procure a baby via surrogacy, and that this is all you know. All that matters is love. I think this is a this is a common sort of normophobic platitude. You know, what really matters in a family is love. And there are the but 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 against that we might we might note that there are in fact a great many stories and a growing number of stories from children who've been raised in families like this who say no actually I always wanted to know who my real father was or I always wanted to know who my real mother was and I always felt like that was missing from my life and I never I never understood I wanted to know where this trait or that gesture or that part and and who've experienced a lifelong hunger. For the missing parent, um, as a consequence of something which which everybody pretended just wasn't really a thing, um, and this is, you know, I, I, I dare say, I, I dare say again, there are a great many very loving same sex couples who raise children, but acknowledging the the pain and the longing for a family of your own, which I, I've experienced, I've experienced miscarriage. I, I I wasn't able to have a child for a long time. I'm gr very grateful for the one that I have now. Um, so I know what it's like to long for a child when you don't have one. Um, but to acknowledge that pain and that longing is not the same as to say we have a right to to displace that pain and that longing onto the child themselves mm. in another form in order to in in order to meet more of our wants, but and, and pretend that this is okay because we've decided that normal is not really a thing. Well, I slept an entire four and a half hours last night. I'm so excited, and nothing will help you get to sleep like Beam Dream. Beam Dream contains a powerful, all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, apigenin, and melatonin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. I don't care what's in it either. 
But the thing is, it's not just a run-of-the-mill sleep aid. It's a concoction carefully crafted to help you ease into the sweet embrace of rest without the grogginess that often accompanies other sleep remedies. And as you can see, I'm now wide awake. Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health. That's why I'm usually such a wreck. You must have a consistent nighttime routine to function at your best. Today, my listeners, get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar, now available in delicious flavors like cinnamon cocoa, chocolate peanut butter, and mint chip Better sleep has never tasted better. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. You get one of those little frothing things. They're lots of fun. If you find yourself battling the bedtime blues, give it a shot. Your weary self will thank you. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, take advantage of a 40% off offer for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin at checkout. That's shop. B-E-A-M.com slash Claven with my promo code Claven for up to 40% off your order. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking anyone can spell beam. How do you please tell me? How do you spell Claven? The argument the left is always making when you stand up for the normative is that you are now excluding. I mean, even the, that line, the two parent privilege, as if it were some kind of unfairness that this works well that you are now excluding the people who are abnormal. And I I have often wondered myself whether, believing as I do, that a male-female marriage for life is, in fact, the best thing that can happen to civilization, to the people involved, to the children that are created by it, is, is there a mindset that humans can have where they think that without feeling that they have to unload hatred and discrimination on gay people or uh, somehow, you know, exclude people from the normal joys of, of living. Is, is there a problem with elevating normalcy, which I think we should, but is there a problem with excluding everybody else? So, so, so the, you're, you're saying the, the leftist argument is that there, there's nowhere, the, 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 it's not simply not possible to, to say, to, to elevate and to center and to speak to normality without, without it then having a punitive set of back lashes on people who don't who don't fit into that template for one, for for one reason or another. I don't think it has to be like that. I mean the copy um, editor I, I, on I my see... on my latest novel tried to take out the word crippled because they said it makes made it sound like somebody mm-hmm. was that that was less than being whole, but in fact it is. And nobody wants to be crippled, everybody wants to be whole and there's nothing wrong with saying that. That doesn't mean I kick people in wheelchairs down the street. Right. <laughs> yeah, to, to me, to me, it it should not be beyond the wit of man to acknowledge, for example, that gay and lesbian people exist, and that same same sex desire is real and and has has a long documented history. Right. It should not be beyond the wit of man to acknowledge that this is true, and that also one, it's what that what we understand that to mean has varied a great deal over the course of human culture and civilization, and two, that this that that it's that the default remains heterosexuality for very straightforward biological reasons. Yeah, we, we, we can we can surely hold those two thoughts in our heads at the same time, can't we? Yes, um, I, that, I, and, I and that we can speak. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And that we, you know, we can we can go and go and have a cocktail with with, with our friend who is uh, who, who's who's non-standard in that way, and and then but also acknowledge the fact that uh, you know the, the, this is not the default, and the default exists for a reason. I, I I believe it's possible to hold those hold those thoughts in mind at the same time. I don't think it follows that I I I, I don't think I don't think ought um, I I don't I don't think there's necessarily a prescriptive. Um, logic that follows from the descriptive one, um, you know, to, to to notice to notice that the sexes are normally a certain way is not to say that if you're if you vary a little bit from that that you should be punished, um, you know, to to, to say to, to to notice that children have certain developmental needs um, is not to say is not to say you know you know that, that we can't make the best of it if things don't quite work out that way um but it's to say we should be aiming for that normal you know we should treat it as a target wherever possible um and that we can we can surely do so in a capacious and a, a capacious way which we, you know, has space for 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 those of us who 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 maybe who maybe deviate from the template a little bit i i i i feel like that ought to be possible somehow somehow it seems very difficult uh, I find that very frustrating, <laughs> uh, but I think you know my my focus my focus in that essay was particularly children, um, because I think the 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 norm of normophobic mindset 
um, presume, asks a great deal of children, asks asks more perhaps of children than the rest of us. I mean, in a sense, you know, it, it's not a big ask of of an adult to to accept variations on the theme. You know, to to accept you know that that, that life doesn't always doesn't always follow exactly a stock template, but to ask children to 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 sacrifice what are a, a lot of the time fundamental developmental needs so that adults can have more freedom or a different set of life choices is i think a, a gross inversion of the duty of care that we that we ought to have to children and i mean we can take much less much less dramatic and much less uh, contentious uh, much more normalized if you <laughs> ironically examples uh, to to illustrate that um, I mean, in institutional daycare really being a case in point, and this is this is pretty much pretty much a third rail across across both sides of the political spectrum because everybody, every, you know, so so much so much of the economy and so much of how we do things is bound up in the continued existence of these facilities. Um, however, um, particularly with extremely young children, they have certain normative developmental needs, and one of those is for a tuned relationship. Um, really, from and and this is particularly pronounced and particularly acute and particularly vital from from birth up to about the age of fifteen months. Um, and if you if you ask a if you ask an infant, uh, especially a neonate, to be to to relinquish that in order that his or her mother can work, perhaps and perhaps she needs to do that in order to be able to eat. You know, I'm not. And again, this is not this is not the exclusionary one that denounces the the, the woman necessarily for doing what she has to do to survive. But I think particularly in in on your side of the pond where there's no federally mandated maternity leave, there are no there, there is pretty much no provision, particularly for poorer women, available um, for for mothers um, after maternity. And there are. I, a huge number of women who go back to work within a few weeks and mm. and 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 that and, and normalizing this is asking is asking more i think than people realize of the babies mm. and 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 i mean i i can't prove it but i think a great deal of what what we're now you've calling the quote unquote mental health crisis and indeed a great deal of the 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 youthful psychiatric uh, and the, the, the highly disturbed and highly dysregulated activism that you see cropping up or, or and or frankly street violence lower down the socioeconomic scale as we saw in 2020 i i wouldn't be at all surprised if the reason if the reason that kind of dysregulated behavior has been on the increase is is straightforwardly connected to the to to to, to, to this to a fundamental state of deprivation which is which which is engendered in children who are who, who are left without those those developmentally vital relational resources particularly in early infancy and and actually what we're seeing are babies who were simply not loved, not mothered enough um for reasons often often beyond the control of their mothers because this is this was simply the position that they found themselves in and to be to be crystal clear this I'm, I'm extremely cautious about making all of this women's fault because it's it, it's always this is a whole culture situation yeah. that we're talking yeah. about but then uh, it, it's a it's a whole culture paradigm that we've all accepted to a to a degree in principle, and the and the and the people who are paying the price and who are in in, in loss and in suffering and in 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 a in front a, a profound deficit of care and love and relational resources are, are babies, yeah. and 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 and, the, and they're paying that price in the name of in the name of economic growth or in the name of of, of individuals' personal freedom, and and to me that's a that's a radical. Uh, upside that a radical inversion of the care that we owe to to the people who need it most which is infants and so you know, when i talk about a bigotry against the normal it's it it's 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 in those sort of th those blind spots to the the normative developmental needs of children that i think it it, it it's everyday atrocities can be found and and they're yeah. starting to become visible at scale and i think I think eventually people will cotton on, but by then it'll be too late for several generations of children who are now adults. You know, I, I, I'm only, I've only got a couple minutes left, and I hate to dump a very complicated question on you <laughs> under those circumstances, uh -oh. but, but there, is, there is something I want to ask you, because you have this, this paragraph, which I think is terrific, in, in the article about normophobia and first things. It says, we cannot wait for the silent majority to rise up and demand a return to common sense or mumble about postponing action until we've re-Christianized the West or until we've devised a fully worked out post-Christian metaphysics of human nature. We may lament the Christianity shaped holder in our discourse, but just because much of modern culture is post-Christian doesn't mean we no longer have a nature. All we've lost is our common framework for naming that nature. But I noticed also at the same time that among your cohort, these 
uh, uh, neo blue stockings, whom I love so much, who are, who are now appearing. I'm sorry, but that's kind of, I can't help thinking of them like that. There seems to be a strong oh, Catholic. Yeah, <laughs> there seems to be this strong uh, Catholic strain. Erica Bacchiocci, Angela Frank, so I just whose work I just love. Uh, Louise Perry, I know, is working is wrestling with uh, Christianity at this point. Is it just a way of describing for naming our nature, or in fact, is there something important there that we're going to have to recover to find our way? There is definitely something going on, and you're not the first person to ask me this. Um, I, I suppose there's different ways you could come at it. You, you might say that uh, feminists who think through how we got to be feminists at all and how we ended up with the value system which underpinned feminism might not unreasonably come to the conclusion that doing away with Christianity do, does away with most of the moral premises that upon which our entire political project is, is founded. And therefore, to try and be a post-Christian feminist is to be sawing off the branch on which you're sat. I think Louise has actually used that phrase. Um, so that's so that's one angle that very straight... <laughs> we've, we, we've now de-Christianized to the point where it, it's becoming increasingly obvious that to be... If, if, you, if you want to make the case for um, the, the, the equal the equal dignity of men and women in the kinds of terms that have, you know, that, that that our our corner of feminism does is is very difficult if you don't have that if you don't have that conceptual framework at your disposal so so that's thing number one but i think there's something something broader going on as well um amongst you know not just in our corner but mu but much more widely amongst uh, people who are thinking about where we are politically um you know on the who are, who i suppose right adjacent but not necessarily in a in a trumpy way if you know what i mean you know the, the the kind of the bookish right. You know, considered more generally, <laughs> there's there's a lot of people who I think are coming. You know, sometimes reluctantly to the conclusion that we're in a kind of Helm's Deep situation here. Um, if you'll forgive the Tolkien metaphor, actually the Tolkien metaphor is pretty apt because what he set out to do um, was to 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 create some sort of I, I, a, a kind I, I suppose a kind of uh, concealed, you know, delivery mechanism for the Christian mythos that might be able to travel beyond um, church sermons and so on. But, but I think uh, to to a, to a great degree, to to a significant extent, we're we're in a kind of Helm's Deep situation, um, and there are, you know, doctrine minor doctrinal difference. You know, doctrine. You know, we can argue about the doctrine of grace and works, but it just doesn't seem to matter very much. You know, mm -hmm. relative to you know, <laughs> relative to what we're facing. Yeah, you know yeah. whether that's tech dystopia or so some other kind of repaganization, um, and I think even even ambivalent agnostics are you know even Richard Dawkins recently you know he's been <laughs> roundly condemned he's been roundly condemned for sort of weakly calling himself a cultural Christian having spent the last twenty years or whatever it is sawing off the branch he was sat on but you know I, I'd say you know let's welcome the maybe we should welcome the prodigal son uh, maybe <laughs> maybe you know. <laughs> You know what's that line from from the Lord of the Rings? You know the elf and the dwarf fighting fighting shoulder you know, fighting shoulder to shoulder. And you know if everything in front of you is is, is orcs, and I've got Richard Dawkins next to me. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that's where we are, then fine. I'm I'm with you 100% on this, Mary. I have to stop you here. I'm sorry. I hope you'll come back. I always love talking to you. I love reading your stuff, and uh, you're doing great work. Uh, again, the feminism against progress is coming out in paperback from Regnery. Really good book. Mary, always great to see you. Thank you for coming on. Such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Again, Mary Harrington, the author of Feminism Against Progress, and you can find her work at Reactionary Feminist. That's her Substack name. And she writes, uh, she's a contributing editor at Unheard, and she's always in first things. And again, one of the first among equals of these new uh, intellectual women who I think are really establishing a new place for all women. Uh, that is is going to be a good thing if they if they catch on and if they have their way. Come to the Andrew Claven show on Friday, and I will have my way there, and I will see you there soon. <laughs>